everyone let's get started with today's topic so kubernetes why do we need it right why not use docker and uh, uh, do with it right so why do we need kubernetes as an orchestration engine so docker let's look at that gives us a couple of things here one is a way to run your application in a contained environment so that it's run in isolation with everything else that's one Secondly, it gives us a standard packaging format to run our application with. So we take our application, take the runtime, package it together, and then we, you know, we can uh, ship it and drop it anywhere, and it just runs the way it would in on your dev environment. So it works the same way in my laptop, works it works the same way on the data center or on cloud or anywhere else. That's what Docker gives us. Now, when you want to run the containers, you can use Docker Run with a single container and keep on running multiples of those. Or you can also, if you want to run a stack of services, like multiple services, you can also compose them together using a tool called as Docker Compose. Docker Compose launches it together, has it interconnected, provides the service discovery and management of that entire stack. However, whether you use Docker or Docker Compose, you are essentially limited to one single node. That is the limitation that you have with Docker uh, Compose. And that is what you want to break out of when you want to go beyond your development environment. Beyond development, when you want to run your containers in production, you want to run them on multiple nodes, uh, tens of nodes, hundreds of nodes, sometimes thousands of nodes as well. And you'll have hundreds of containers to run day in and day out because you are essentially uh, talking about immutable deployments. With containers in production, in staging, with tools like Kubernetes, we do immutable deployments. So we don't go to the same servers, upgrade those, and restart the services. We don't do that. We throw away the servers or equivalent of those uh, traditionally that we used to do and we replace them with the new ones. So we replace the instances in this case, container instances with new ones every time that we want to run uh, or make any changes, right? So that's what we want to do. And when we have like hundreds of containers to launch on tens or hundreds of nodes, uh, what are the challenges that we need to deal with? Let's uh, talk about that, right? So the first challenge that you'll have to worry about is when you have hundreds of containers to run where to run those right so the scheduling issue so where to run which container is a classic scheduling problem next is once we decide to run them on these different nodes how do we connect them together because we are talking about these microservices which are interconnected which talk to each other and so on and we need to think about networking the containers as well right so how do we connect those containers together is the networking con uh, topic and then we have to deal with high availability auto scaling load balancing service discovery uh, rolling out the new version going from one version to another so implementing release strategies and so on right and that's where we need a solution that either you build it yourself imagine every organization in the world doing it you know and repeating this themselves or you have a solution out of the box which gives you all these features just out of the box. And wouldn't that be nice? And that's where Kubernetes comes in, right? That's where Kubernetes comes in. Uh, that's why we need Kubernetes to make sure that we run our application container-based workloads in production-like environment with scale, high availability, auto scaling, self-healing, roll out the new versions and whatnot. And uh, that is what we do with uh, Kubernetes basically, right? So that's what Kubernetes is all about. And uh, how does it work is basically takes all the nodes that you have, right? All the container nodes that you have, imagine connecting them together and forming a logical cluster out of it. And that's what we do with Kubernetes, right? And then we have some manager nodes, like they're called as control planes. And then the worker nodes, those are the ones which participate in the cluster and run your container-based workloads. That's what you do with 
uh, this. And as far as we are concerned, we are not talking about three nodes, 30 nodes, 300 nodes, 3000 nodes. We just look at it as one large cluster to submit the workloads to. And we can look at it as logically, oh, I have thousand cores and like 15 terabytes of RAM to run my workloads with. And that's the Kubernetes environment that we talk to logically, right? That is what Kubernetes is all about. Now I'll save the story and all that. I have it as part of my course typically, uh, but we'll jump onto the architecture of Kubernetes where Kubernetes just like uh, Docker has this client server architecture, right? Uh, by the way, if you have questions, you can start adding it uh, to the chat I, uh, and the Q&A section. So I will get to it whenever uh, I can, right? So uh, I see some, a oh, lot of high messages. And then Sumanth says, you're from USA. How is the market in DevOps? DevOps is, uh, you know, there is a demand. Right now, there is also, there is a good amount of supply and demand. There is that, uh, you know, but if you keep yourself up to date and start picking up the new skills in the field, um, there's always a demand for you, right? Even though the market is not the best in terms of uh, the job opportunities right now, and that has been the case for the last two years, I still see pockets of opportunities, especially if you start uh, upgrading the, your skills and start picking up the new skills, especially in the field of Kubernetes, CICD, Argo, DevSecOps, FinOps, uh, AIML, MLOps, and so on, because uh, especially the AI evolving, MLOps is in demand today as well. So you have a lot of opportunities opening in that area. So you need to constantly keep on upgrading yourself uh, so that you put yourself in the best position uh, in, in terms of, uh, let's say, the job opportunities. Yeah, Deepak says, good evening. Yes, okay, what about freshers? Uh, I will be very honest, Karthik. Uh, for the freshers at the moment, it has been a bit of a tough market. I wouldn't just say that, hey, uh, no, this everything is uh, hunky-dory and everything looks great. Uh, for the fresher, and it's not just about DevOps. Uh, in general, the market has been tough uh, for the freshers since about last year. Uh, we really hope that it opens up uh, from this this year onwards. But uh, while that is happening, what you could do is the, to make the best usage of this time. You start learning new things. And what I would recommend is you start, uh, let's say, um, you know, mostly uh, pick up some open source projects, start contributing to the open source project, build your portfolio so that whenever the opportunities start coming in, uh, or you make opportunities, You, whenever you start opportunities coming in, you are in the best position to get hired there. That's one. Secondly, you can make opportunities come your way if you start uh, like exploring those, start you know saying that I would like to just learn from you, approach people and start learning, uh, saying that I can help you and learn from you. So maybe look, start looking for the opportunities there. But uh, uh, I will be honest there, it's been uh, a tough market and uh, remains so uh, even this year so far at least, right? So that's the that's the situation right now. So you need to make, uh, don't get disappointed because you know, it will open up, of course. It has been tough for a lot of experienced people, not just freshers, uh, right? But um, it'll get better. And when that happens, make yourself uh, available to those opportunities by making sure that you are in the right uh, position when that happens. All right. So um, let's talk about the Kubernetes architecture now. So Kubernetes is a client server model. So you have uh, just like Docker, which has a client and a server, you have Kubernetes, which also has the server side component and the client side component. The server side component though has multiple components, including API server, uh, which is the point of contact for everyone. It's like um, if this was in government, API server is like an external affairs minister and they're the ones, or maybe diplomats, they're the ones who are the interface uh, for that entire you know, country. Uh, they're the ones who represent that country and they're the ones who interact with the you know, foreign uh, you know, delegates and so on. So it's like that. So you, everyone in case of Kubernetes goes via the API server and then that interfaces with all the other components inside the cluster. 
what are the other components the second component is the scheduler the job of the scheduler is simple to decide what runs where however it is very very sophisticated right as in um it basically knows about your workloads it knows about the um you know kind of uh, uh what uh, any scheduling constraints that you have it knows about um, the resources available on the nodes and based on that it decides the right node to run your uh, right kind of a job right the third component is the controller manager that is the one which ships all those interesting cool features that we you know uh, that we want to use from kubernetes like high availability scalability ability to roll out from one version to another ability to go uh, you know um, basically maintain the scale and so on or automatically scale as well all of those are different types of controllers some of the controllers depending on the kind of workloads that you have there are five different types of controller which are packaged into that controller manager one is state uh, for stateless applications you have deployments for agents for running some sort of agents uh, like you want to run a pod on every single node uh, you have daemon sets for running stateful application you have stateful sets for running jobs or cron jobs scheduled jobs you have a couple of controllers as well and all of that gets packaged into the controller manager then comes the hcd hcd is like a configuration store that stores everything related to your cluster the state of the cluster is stored in hcd so think of it as some sort of a database uh, which holds that kind of an information and then you have three components on every node number one is kubelet kubelet is like a agent for the control plane which is sitting on every node uh, running the containers kubelet is responsible for doing that kubelet is responsible for doing the health checks and reporting everything back to the headquarters which is the uh, through api server in hcd and then we have uh, runtime the actual runtime like docker rocket runcy cryo uh, one of that that kubelet interfaces with and then there is a kub proxy which is responsible for some service networking load balancing etc now that is what we have in terms of uh, on every single node including the control plane as well right and those are the components which exist on uh, every a uh, node in the cluster right so this is the control plane component and these three exist on every node and then there are some additional components like for service discovery based on dns we have core dns for networking we have cni plugins uh, flannel weave calico and so on right so that's what uh, you know uh, that is how the kubernetes architecture looks like uh, these are the core components of kubernetes that you should at least be aware of right when you're getting started it's fine um to not to worry too much about each of the component in, in depth but even if you can name those components four components like api server scheduler controller manager etcd that's good enough right uh, now i want to show you a setup of kubernetes environment three nodes actually there are various ways you can do that okay there are various ways you can do that uh, we are going to use a tool called as kind kind stands for kubernetes inside docker and what makes it special is the ease with which you can create a kubernetes environment with kind all you need is docker installed and set up with client server and then you install this utility called as kind and what it allows you to do is essentially uh, create a three node cluster very quickly right with this kind of an environment so with kind you create three containers those containers act like kubernetes nodes that's why the name kubernetes inside docker as in three docker nodes they form the cluster and that's what you use so your you are setting up a three node environment very quickly with a very little amount of uh, you know complexity and few steps uh, required to do that right so kartik has a question a uh, cloud controller manager role in the architecture cloud controller is uh, uh, it depends so if you are talking about cloud controller there is no component called as cloud controller which is part of the uh, kubernetes environment by default um 
there is controller manager of course but if you're talking about cloud controller or something related to that it might be an add-on uh, when you deploy the kubernetes environment on maybe some cloud platform and there you may have these uh, cloud controllers or additional controller there are many additional controllers that you can install and work with right right so that's those are the components of the kubernetes control plane api server exposes everything as api allows you to manage everything via code because everything is an api resource so when you write a manifest a yaml manifest for deployment service it gets converted into an api call a json format api call restful communication and then based on that it connects to rest of the components including the scheduler uh hcd hcd is which stores the information controller manager like deployment stateful sets allow you to run a particular type of application in a certain way that's the role of the controller manager and then you have three components running on every node kubelet is responsible it's like a manager on a node it's like an office you have multiple offices and every office has a manager kubelet is the manager there right and then the runtime actual work is done by uh, the subordinates those that includes the runtime here uh, typically docker or cryo or you know um, let's say container d and then kuproxy is for networking purposes service networking all right, I'm gonna remove myself. I don't need to be here. Uh, yes, so that's the container runtime. All right, that's the architecture of Kubernetes. Uh, you can also take a screenshot of this if you want. Okay, so next thing that I wanna show you is how do you set up the Kubernetes environment with kind. So kind is a tool which I've already installed, it works with kubectl. So you install kubectl, you install kind, you install docker. I have docker installed here. And now with these three utilities being there, I would show you how easy it is to set up a Kubernetes environment with kind itself. So I have a lab guide here. I will, uh, by the way, I'm writing extensive lab guides uh, on Kubernetes. I have updated all the labs uh, related to Kubernetes, plus there are additional advanced Kubernetes labs that I've added. I've added like uh, tens of labs in the last few, last month or so on EKS, on Argo CD, on, uh, you know, let's say additional advanced topics and so on. And all of these are available uh, to everyone. You can share it with all your friends as well, whoever wants to learn Kubernetes, there are a bunch of labs out here. So uh, here we go, right? So we're talking about installing Kubernetes with kind. Kind is utility, which is very interesting. It uses your existing Docker environment, right? This is my Docker environment. You don't see any containers yet. That will change. I'll just clean up my environment. Even if I have any stopped containers and so on, this will clean them up. And then it's a three-step process to launch a cluster. This cluster is for lab environment, okay? This is not a production environment. Okay, I already have this code directory. And then I go inside this path where I have a file. This is where I define my cluster configuration. A three node environment, first node is control plane, second node is a worker, third node is a, uh, also a worker. Since this is gonna run inside Docker, there are certain ports, like when I use a node port on the node, my nodes are going to be my containers actually. So I have to do some port mapping so that whenever I have containers running here, uh, I make them available via my host. Typically with Docker, we do the port mapping just like that. From here, we do the port mapping basically to make the containers available. That is what this configuration is here. And to set up this environment, all I have to do is say kind create cluster and then provide this file, the file I just showed you, the YAML file, and it reads that YAML file. That YAML file has a definition of three nodes. If you add five nodes, it will create a five node cluster. If you add two nodes, it'll create two node cluster. It's up to you. And you can see it's launching the cluster with the latest version of Kubernetes. It's gonna create a three node environment. It's writing all the configuration, creating the control plane now, starting that. And then it will join the nodes after which 
I should see my cluster up and running. You can see it's configured the networking, the storage, uh, creating the worker nodes, joining them to the cluster. And now I have it all up and running. And then I can validate by running kubectl get nodes. What this does, it shows me three nodes listed and ready, which means my cluster is already set up. I'm just gonna launch one more utility that I typically use in all my trainings. It's called as visualizer. And what this does is uh, this will launch an application called as visualizer, which comes up on uh, a particular uh, port. So I have two commands that I typically use, get nodes. So nodes should be listed and ready. Get pods should show you everything running, mostly kub system namespace. That is the control plane namespace. And as you can see, that control plane namespace has these components that I just mentioned to you. That's why you should at least know which are the components which become part of the Kubernetes control plane. API server, controller manager, etcd, scheduler, DNS, networking, CNI plugin, and kub proxy. In addition to that, there are two more components, one for the storage, one for the visualizer. The visualizer is the application which runs or shows me uh, how my cluster looks like visually, which I'm gonna demonstrate to you once it comes up. Now, this typically takes a bit of a time because these days, uh, Docker Hub throttles the images. So it takes a long time to download these images. That's what is probably happening. If I describe this pod, you will see what's going on. It's pulling the image. It takes time. Let that happen. I will come back and start demonstrating everything to you, but my cluster is essentially ready, right? And then I will show you how to deploy a five tier microservices application on top of Kubernetes. To do that, you need to know about these core concepts. How to deploy the application, what kind of application this is. Uh, let's talk about that. So with Docker, we typically take the application, build an image, and then run that as a container. With Kubernetes, we don't just run a container, but we take that container, wrap it inside something called as a pod. The pod becomes the unit of deployment in Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes, we don't run just one container, but it's essentially a pod. Pod is a collection of containers, one or more containers, which need to launch together and run together on the same host. Uh, that is what we create this pod concept for. Right, And it is the pod that we launch, it is the pod that we replicate, it is the pod that we scale. Pod is the unit of deployment replication scheduling in Kubernetes. Right, And then when we have an application like this to run, what we essentially do is for every single application for front end, for DB, you're going to launch a different set of pods because we want to talk, when we talk about microservices, each one needs to scale independently. So each one will have its own set of pods or replicas of pod. And for DB, you'll have a different set. For, for front end, you'll have a different set of pods. And we want to scale it. We want to create a high available setup and so on. So how do we achieve that is by creating a pod and launching a bunch of those for an application. For front end, let's say I run four instances of the application. So we are scaling this. To scale it and to maintain it, the number of replicas, how many pods to run, etc., we use something called as a replication controller or a replica set, basically. A replica set is responsible for two things. One is the replication. So replication gives us the scaling. So it is responsible for scalability. That's number one. It is also responsible for 
availability. As in, if let's suppose we ask it to run four pods and if there is a problem and one of the pod goes away or maybe the node on which it is running has a problem, it will detect it. It will find out that, oh, this pod is not running. So let's launch one more. It will replace it with one, one more. And that is the high availability feature of a replication controller. So when you run it with a replica set or a replication controller, it runs a set of replicas of a pod and then it maintains X number of replicas. That's your scalability. And then it makes sure that those are available. So that's the high availability part, right? So that's what you need in order to run the pod. So you just run, don't run the pods by themselves. You run them via some controller like a replication. And then replication controller does these two things high availability and scalability, but it is not capable of go rolling out or going moving from one version to another. How do you do that is where you take the replica set or replication controller and add the strategy and what you get is a deployment. And that deployment gives you that additional strategy like rolling update or recreate. And through that it knows, oh, when you have a new version, how to go about upgrading your application to the new version. Should you do it uh, step by step? Should you replace these, stop them, delete them and create new ones with a downtime? So that is defined with some sort of strategies. And I think that's part of the deployment. So essentially you create a deployment which internally launches a replica set and then it also knows how to go from one replica set to another. That is one version to another. That's the deployment for you, right? And then on top of that, when you have multiple instances, you want to spread your traffic across those instances. So you want to set up some sort of a load balancer so that the users connect to this load balancer or this endpoint. And from there, it goes and spreads the traffic across these available set of pods. This is called as a service. And service comes with an IP. This is a Kubernetes service. Service comes with an IP, comes with a DNS. And uh, then if one service wants to talk to another, it typically can use a name that is a DNS. So web DB. So from web, you can just say host name is equal to DB and it will connect to the uh, load balancer or service from there. It will pick one of the endpoints. It will connect to one of the pods in the database pool. That is how the service discovery works. And that is why we need that DNS component within our cluster called as core DNS. Right. Uh, those are some of the core components of Kubernetes. So for every application, let's say you have a two tier application app and DB, you will typically create a deployment, which will launch a set of pods and a service, which will allow you to access that application from outside or inside, right? That's what you do with your application. Now, if I want to deploy a five tier microservice like this, vote Redis worker DB result. How do I go about it? What are the components that I create and so on, right? Uh, Rama has a question, um, is, is replica set and replication controller same or different? Now there is a slight different, they're almost similar. Think of, they're almost similar. There's one slight difference I'll, uh, I'll show you. So if you run kubectl API resources, First, there was only replication controller. So replication controller is part of the core set of APIs. If you look at this, there's a replica set and I think they have removed the replication controller now or it's there, it's there, RC is there. Uh, you can see this is part of V1. These are like core APIs. Is it when the Kubernetes was released 10 years ago, by the way, we are celebrating the 10th birthday of Kubernetes this week. Kubernetes turns 10 this week, this very week. So it was announced in the June of 2014 and the first version was released in 2015. So it's been 10 years now and it has, you know, changed the world really. Uh, so replication controller was the original one. There was only replication controller earlier, then came the extensions API, which became a apps, a apps group. And that has a replica set along with the deployment. So deployment, essentially comes with a replica set. Replica set component of the deployment is equivalent of replication controller. The job is same. 
the job of both are same. So whether you use replication controller or replica set, it does those two things, availability and uh, uh, let's say scalability. There is some difference though, I'll talk, talk about that. Essentially replication controller is needed for this. If it just reports, uh, if there is a problem, if there is a node down, your application is down. If you run it via replication controller, that box is the replication controller watching for the pods. Then this happens and let's say the pods uh, uh, get deleted on the node, it will replace them on some other node, right? So that's the way it works. So replication controllers work with the labels and selectors. So you have a selector configuration where you say, oh, I want to select the pod because you run pods and how replication maintain controller maintains the set of pods it has to watch is via the selectors. So you have labels, you have selectors and you match them and you say that, oh, these are the ones I want to watch for. Now, difference between replication controller and replica set is slight. So here the selector says, I can only watch for pods with properties which are ANDed, A and B and C. So you can only do this and that versus replica set allow you to select from a set of values. So you can say expressions, you can use expression saying that this and this and A and B and any of this set V1, V2, V3. So X and Y, right? So you can do ending, you can do or this or that from this set, not from this set or this property should be set but I don't care about the values. You can write those kind of expressions and that's why it is called as a replica set probably because it provides the set based selector. And the main difference beyond this technical difference between replication control and replica set, which is the newer one, is this, the rollout. How do you go from one version to another? With replica set, you can add that as an update strategy, as a code, you can add that as a code and what you get is a deployment. So essentially, deployment is the ultimate thing that we replace replication controllers with. And deployment internally creates a replica set, which acts like a replication controller. And then you take the replica set, you add the update strategy, you get the deployment, right? That's what happens. This is the replica set. Then you add the strategy. How do you go from one version to another? You get a deployment. Right, that's what what a that's what makes up a deployment. Okay, Monica has a question. What is the difference between deployment and deployment config? Uh, if you're asking this question, I am assuming you are coming from OpenShift world. In case of OpenShift, so when Kubernetes created deployment, uh, initially there was only replication controller, and Kubernetes came with deployment and replica set much later. In the meanwhile, OpenShift was there and OpenShift created its own version of how you should add the strategy and deployment and that is called as a deployment config. So in the world of OpenShift, equivalent of deployment is deployment config. And if you are using an OpenShift, if you do it via OpenShift pass solution, it is typically deployment config. At least the last time I checked it was. Uh, but internally, you can also use a deployment there. So that's almost like parallel to what we have deployment is what you call as a deployment config in OpenShift. OpenShift is just a pass or a platform as a solution on top of Kubernetes. All right, so another question from Karthik is replication controller, maybe it acts like auto scaling. No, auto scaler is different. It's none of replication controller replica set deployment. Autoscaler in Kubernetes is called as HPA or horizontal pod autoscaler. Yeah, this is the one which is built in to Kubernetes, but there is also a vertical pod autoscaler that you can implement as an additional controller. But this is what is autoscaler, horizontal pod autoscaler or HPA. This works with deployment, this works with replica set, this works with replication controller, and it manages the scale for you. So when you have HPA, it takes over the replica uh, config. Okay, uh, Ranganathan has a question, but he's asking in private. 
first of all my uh, request is do not send the questions in private because all of this is relevant and i cannot take the private questions anyways this is not a uh, you know kind of a private coaching anyways right so uh, put all the questions in public and the question is uh, can you tell how to write yaml form files on your own uh, i generally do like 3 4 5 days workshop on this so in one hour it is almost impossible to um, you know teach you how to write yaml files on my own on your own but you can take the course by the way and uh, uh, we have a very extensive course on kubernetes and i'm building many other courses on kubernetes actually which is part of our platform already so if you go to schoolofdevops.com as uh, uh, once you log in once you become a uh, get the membership here you will find a course on kubernetes uh, out there it's a very detailed course already and i'm adding new courses on advanced kubernetes eks argo cd and stuff like that so this course on kubernetes is already uh, there It's on the second page. And you can see it takes you, takes a deep dive approach into writing the YAML code. So a lot of this is about YAML code, right? So there's Kubernetes concept, setting up the environment. And then we have, uh, you know, right from services to pods, to replication controllers, to, you know, deployments, to uh, stateful sets and whatnot, uh, releases, volumes config maps and secrets and it's a very detailed course uh, there so um, if you are interested in diving into it uh, you can take the membership or you can co take this course independently uh, from udemy or somewhere uh, if you want to take the membership uh, i will share the offer we share during the this is a webinar special offer so the typical membership if you take it from the site here is 11.999 and you can get it with the deal this is the one i recommend which gives you access to all the courses including kubernetes for one year and um, i've shared an offer that you can also take uh, that will be available for the next 15 minutes if you are not from india uh, you can directly um, enroll using 90 ddc 15 that is 90 day challenge uh 15 off offer uh that i've shared on the chat as well okay so uh there are a few more questions so uh, one question from naga prasad is how vertical replicas different from replica sets see if you're asking me about vertical pod auto scaler that is more about something to do with resources I'm just trying to get to my whiteboard. Okay. So there is something called as replication controller replica set is all horizontal scaling, right? So it's all about horizontal scaling, right? So with HPA, you launch multiple instances and just launch create replicas of it. With vertical pod auto scaler, what you do is vertical scaling is you go from small to large to extra large to uh, XX large. And that is mostly about configuration resources. So instead of one core, you say, I give you two cores or four cores or eight cores, incrementally resources like CPUs and memory. I just give you an example of CPU here. That is the VPA or vertical pod order scaler. Typically, when you set up VPA, why do you set up VPA is to right size your instances and based on the realistic load, how to adjust that configuration for resources is where VPA is essential. So you typically use HP and VPA in combination when you try to do auto scaling. That's uh, mostly about how you do the auto scaling part. Now, coming back here, uh, what I'm going to demonstrate here is mostly about very simplistic way of setting up this, uh, 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 you know, application deployment using the deployment services and uh, namespace and so on. That is what I was talking about here. So let me explain how, if I have to deploy this microservices application stack with five services on Kubernetes. So this is the application stack. I have images for each and I want to deploy this on my Kubernetes environment. 
how do you go about doing that is what i'm talking about now what are the components that you need there right so this is the application five services the user interfaces with two of these services the vote application where they submit the vote result application where they view the results of consolidated results you know based on multiple votes actually and it's immediate results that you see here behind that though there are for multiple microservices backing services as we can call it so when you submit the vote there is this is a polyglot microservices application this is python app this is node.js there is a java app and then there are two backing services there one of that is redis so when you submit the vote the vote gets stored in redis until a java worker comes in and picks up the vote and then it consolidates processes and stores in db from there the result application queries and displays the vote so that's the workflow simple application but uses all the microservices there uh, this is a sample application created by docker originally and there are five microservices here so if you want to deploy it you need to run five deployments because you need to run the pods for each right so five deployments and four services so worker in this case just needs a deployment not a service because you don't see incoming connections to worker if nobody is connecting to worker it does not need a service service is typically needed when oh when you want to connect from here to here using a name you create a service for redis or if you want to access it from outside you create a service that's when you create services so worker doesn't need one and that's why five deployments for five applications four services for vote redis db and result and two of the services will expose this application to the outside world so there are different types of services available there i'll talk about that briefly as i deploy these so how do i go about deploying it is uh, uh, i will do that using commands and then this is my uh, i'll also put my visualizer out here so i deployed my uh, application on this server and i said i am launching a visualizer this is the visualizer it's come up what that means is i should see my cluster visually using this tool so i'll start watching for this put it on the right hand side you see the visualizer on the right right shows you the status of what's going on uh, what is running where right so you see three nodes those three boxes three nodes uh, are three nodes and then the small green boxes are the containers running on those nodes as i start running deploying you are going to see more containers uh, being added and i will start watching for everything from here use a watch utility on my mac and uh, you see uh, i when i'm logged in i see currently all the pods that are running there typically whatever is created so far when you have a shared environment with hundreds of developers and thousands of pods running in a cluster you don't want everyone to step on everyone else's work so what you need to do when you get started with your project is create something called as a namespace just bringing up the presentation to that point so what is a namespace namespace is basically now we want to deploy this five tier application on a bunch of nodes like three nodes or four nodes what do we do is we create a cluster out of these nodes and we start looking at that cluster as a logical thing behind it underneath it we may have three nodes 30 nodes 300 nodes uh, that we can scale up but as far as the kubernetes environment is concerned we look at it as one single box that box the logical thing can be partitioned into different namespaces so that when we deploy the application we or when we are working with it we are looking at only one single uh, kind of a project or one single environment right so that's your namespace so namespace offers the logical partitioning 
and it is a foundation for uh, multi-tenancy actually and within that namespace let's say i create a namespace for a project instavote and everything related to instavote i deploy it in that namespace that's the right way to do it right so that's what i'm going to do here create a namespace switch to it so that this view will clear up and i'll see the namespace for my project that is instavote just creating a namespace called as instavote I can list the namespaces first. These are the default ones and I create one more. So I get a new namespace created just a second ago. And then I'll switch to that namespace so that my view changes to Instavote. So all the users in my team will have this view currently in blank because I have not deployed anything. And this is where I start running my application starting with my first application, the vote application here, the front end. And to do that, I would use, I'm not talking about YAML code at all. I can write it though. So something like this, create, and I'm creating uh, what a deployment. I can create a deployment. I can create a service using a command or using a YAML file. In fact, this command can be converted into YAML. That part I will show you. So I'm creating a deployment. If I don't know how, I can always use minus minus help options. Shows me all the options plus some examples. That's useful for me. Something like this. So I can copy it over and then just modify whatever I need. So I'm deploying, creating a deployment for the vote application with a particular image. Uh, image is given, let's imagine let's say version four of this and how many instances I want, I can define it. Uh, if there is a port that this runs on, I can define that and so on. And uh, port here, right? And then I can apply it this way or I can also do a dry run minus o YAML. Dry run will not run it, but it will just do a, a check basically. And then minus a YAML will generate a YAML for me. So this is a quick way of generating a YAML. Yeah, this is typically a Kubernetes spec, YAML spec here. And uh, that's what is gonna get created, a deployment with uh, this particular template and this container and spec and all that. Uh, so that's one way to quickly generate the YAML. I'm not doing that, I'm just deploying it directly. So one replica deployment, you can see that uh, on the right, something just launched on this node uh, blinking in yellow yeah that will turn to green in uh, a few seconds or a few minutes based on how long it takes to build the uh, pull the image but you see a deployment deployment has created this replica set for this particular version so for every single revision every single version there will be a new replica set created by deployment and that's how it moves from this to that and so on it's still creating the container. Once it is up, I will also show you how the uh, scalability works, how the high availability works, uh, how the load balancing works with the services and so on. I'll in fact create a service so that I can expose that application to the outside world. So I'm creating a service. There is a special service called as node port. That's how you expose your application outside. Just like this application is outside, uh, I'm able to access it from outside. I can launch my application, make it available to the outside world. Let me scale this up a little bit. Yeah, once the service is created on 30,300 port or whichever port I ask it to, it will make the application available, right on this particular port. For this to work, my container should be in a running state. It is running state, so I see the V4 running. 
right? That's how I expose my application to the outside world. That's how I access my application by creating a service. So for that, you need a service. Even when you want one application to connect to another, like this application needs to connect to the backend, you still need a service there. Now, before we explore that, let's talk about the key features of Kubernetes. One is the scalability. Kubernetes, when you deploy your application, you can run it with, uh, it's scalable, it is high available. Uh, I'm gonna show you the scale by manipulating it manually right now and high availability as well. How do I scale it is using kubectl scale command. What am I scaling is a deployment whose name is vote. And this is where I define the scale. How many instances I want, I say four. So what you see here is immediately it launches three more instances or starts launching it. It may take some time because it's now pulling the image on a different node also. This will take time, but you see it has started scaling immediately after that. And not only that, once you have multiple instances running your service, if I put this on auto refresh, I have a refresh plugin. Put it on auto refresh for three seconds. You see every three seconds is going to a new container. Right now I just have, oh, I have four now, all are running. So you see every three seconds, it goes to a new pod ending MR. So it's going to this one. Now it's 7B. So this one, 55, this one, 7B again, this one, and 4N. So this is basically acting like a load balancer by default, by design. So when you create a service in Kubernetes, you already have a load balancer. And that's another feature. We looked at scalability and you can go from, oh, four to seven equally easily. It just launches three more. Yeah, uh, from seven to 12, you know, in a few seconds, you can see how fast does Kubernetes scale. It's that fast actually, right? The scales within seconds, not minutes, not hours, right? Uh, just pending because maybe the capacity requirements here, it takes time or it doesn't have any enough resources here. And you can scale it down as well. So in case if you want to scale it down equally easy, set the replicas to five, it will delete uh, in this case pending and the uh, remaining ones which are not needed. Okay. There is a possibility that um, my server configuration is uh, very low and it may not take this much load also. So it may, I may have to reset in that case. There is nothing else I can do. If that happens, there's nothing else I, I, will have, I can do. I just have to go and reset it. It's probably that's what is happening right now. Uh, all right, so this is uh, like a very small, tiny environment. And if I try to scale it beyond a certain numbers, it goes down. It's a server setup here. And I believe this is uh, two cores and two GB. Yeah, so that is uh, the reason why, you know, it's not able to take that much of scale. So how do I fix it is I'll have to either reset this and resize it, or I'll have to basically, uh, re I mean, I'll have to recreate that environment anyways again, uh, but I'll have to shut it down, reset and uh, so on. So that's what I'll have to do here. Uh, but for now, I'm just gonna re reset that cluster very quickly and try to recreate it. You can see the API server also went, uh, went down right here. 
So I uh, just have one option here right now, that is resetting it. Uh, okay, in the meanwhile, if you have any questions, I would uh, I could take those as well. I'm also going to share this offer one more time in case if you any of you want to uh, take that. Okay, you can use the chat or Q and A uh, to post your questions. Now, once this comes up, um, it will automatically come up here, actually. I will not bother about Visualizer right now, uh, but I'll just deploy this application once the cluster is up. Uh, to do that, it's just a matter of uh, saying, it will take time to pull the image, but otherwise, it's just a matter of creating a deployment and a service. You see the cluster is up, created deployment. I will launch the service and uh, I should be up. I'll stick to three, four pods and that's it. Yeah. So if I scale it to, let's say five, right? You'll see that it starts refreshing and when it refreshes it will start uh, pointing to new set of pods i showed you how to scale out scale in so i can scale in from five to two for example okay, equally easily you can see terminates that i can go back to six right so scaling is very easy right scaling out scaling in quick and easy uh, Rama has a question, when to use Visualizer. Visualizer is uh, just a learning tool or if you just want to get a visual, uh, visual representation of your cluster, uh, which is easy to see and understand and learn, uh, that's when it is useful. Especially for learning, I find it is very useful. And then it's more or less like a tool to just get a visual idea about you, what's going on, right? So that's when uh, it is useful. All right, so Karthik has a question about um, could you please tell us the way to access free AWS real-time projects? Uh, I'm not sure what the question is. If you're talking about AWS resources, uh, you have a free tier access, which you can use uh, for one year. You have like access to limited type of resources, which you can continue to use for one year, like one easy to instance uh rds uh, storage s3 storage and so on and so forth uh, if you're talking about projects um free you can find a lot on youtube possibly or um i have demo apps but that's nothing to do with aws really um these are the demo application that i have collected over the years which you can use to experiment uh, and build the devops projects with right so that's uh, what i have that's what I can suggest to you. So, um, okay, I've shown you the scalability. Let me show you the high availability part of it as well. The high availability part is just that uh, if the pods get deleted, whatever reason, right? So it could be underlying node issue or a pod issue. It will always bring it back. Look at the age here. So I'll delete a pod, which has been there for two minutes. Another one, which is there for one, one, three seconds. And both of these got deleted. You can see new pods took its place. Two new pods were created just a few seconds ago. And no matter how many times you do that, you will see that repeat. Yeah, so you see, this is repeating.
So that's the availability part of it. So no matter how many times you delete the pods, it will always come back up. And uh, that's what you see, you know, happen with, uh, let's say, the um, Kubernetes replica set. Replica set is maintaining the scale. In this case, the scale is set to six. So immediately it detected the current going down. The current went, would have went down to four. It detected that it has to maintain six and it takes an action by launching the new set of pods. And that's what you saw happen every time. So as long as the scale is set, it will just work with that automatically, right? Now I'm setting the scale to eight, for example. Here, I'm gonna uh, start watching for a few things actually. Yeah, what I want to show you is the version. Version is not set actually here, but uh, let's say we want to roll out a new version. How does that work, right? So deployment uh, not only gives us the ability to maintain the scale and availability, it also gives us a way to roll out a new version. And when you do that, you can do it in a certain way without causing a downtime, with downtime, whatever. You can define that as a strategy. That's a rollout strategy. Now I have this set up for uh, refresh every three seconds already. And then I'm going to roll out for that. I'll just add some configuration. I'm editing this object in Kubernetes. And then I'll say uh, add some properties or strategy for rollout. So I'm doing batch updates and the batch is set to three. Two plus one, so it is set to three with this configuration. So what I'm trying to do now is roll out a new version. For that, I can use a set command and set the image to let's say V5. So what I'm trying to do is set the image for deployment vote to version five. And then I'll watch for the status here for this rollout. So as soon as I do that and say enter, uh, the image is updated, it would have started a rollout. A new rollout has started with a batch of three. So it's gonna roll out in three batches. So what you're gonna see is a uh, part of this is set to V3. Some new pods you see right so some new parts that you see are with version 3 the ones here three of those three are up to date right that's the new version so it has created a new replica set and it is scaling up this one scaling this down so this will go from three to six there is an interval of 20 second that gap that i've set up that's my configuration so it's gone from three to six now so six are with the new version v5 so you see v4 and v5s both but the application does not go down, right? That's the beauty of it. So this is how the rollouts happen here. This is called as a rolling update or a zero downtime deployment. And slowly and gradually, this version takes over, this version scales down. Now eventually it is zero. That's what is happening. So you see six are up to date. Six are with new version, four are with older version. Every 20 seconds, there is a new rollout. With Visualizer, this is even more intuitive. Let me see if I can launch it. Once this is done, I'll show you by launching it. So this will scale to eight. It has already, and it will delete one, which is remaining. So that is the end of my rollout. It says one pending for termination. That's the end of rollout.
<coughs> yeah, the visualizers are come up again. I'll try to see if I can show you here how the rollout happens. You will notice now every 20 seconds there is a new version, new batch of pods which go out. Uh, that's what you're gonna see. So I'm rolling out a new, yet one, uh, another version, V6. Let's watch the rollout here. Uh, let's also watch it on the right hand side. You see three of those replicas updated. Every 20 second, you're gonna see that repeat. It has created yet another replica set, three new replicas with V6. Uh, some pods with v6 mostly with v5 right now you'll see some with v6 and that will see uh, that will pick change gradually eventually more of v6 less of v5s and then just v6 nothing v5 Yeah, so six of uh, the new version, uh, four with older version. Yeah, that's how it rolls out. All right, and I think the rollout is complete already, and uh, we are not on a v v6 completely, right? Without any downtime, that's the rollout, and that's the deployment, and these are some of the features of uh, Kubernetes. And then I can go on and talk about uh, many, but uh, based on the time, we will kind of uh, wrap it up here. There's just one more feature I'll talk about that is service discovery. So if you see this part. Uh, it shows up the front end, but the moment I click on the button, it will eventually throw an error. That's because this is just a facade. That's just a front end. It's not an entire service stack. My application is made up of five services. So this front end needs to connect to at least Redis to store these votes. When you submit the vote on that, uh, clicking by that button. How does it connect to the Redis is if you look at the vote application and uh, look at the code app.py, it connects using the DNS. So you need to create a service for Redis and there has to be some pods behind the scene. So you need both. And for that, I can launch my uh, Redis application using this information which is given here. To launch Redis, I can use this image. So I'll create a deployment for Redis with this image. I will also scale the vote replicas to two. So let's create a Redis deployment and I'll need a service for Redis. This is a service port for Redis and a normal service called as cluster IP. We just want the boat application to connect to Redis. That's all. 
So now what happens is the, since the service is there and since there are pods behind it, uh, if I try to vote, it does not throw an error, rather it gives me a check mark, meaning there is a backend service available. So I don't have to worry about, oh, what is the IP address of this Redis uh, or how do I discover it and all that. It's already there. I have a service, so I can use the name called a service and from vote, it will automatically resolve here and connect to it. You can see that. So if I get inside the container here or the pod, and say connect to Redis or look up Redis, it is pointing to the Redis's IP address. That's the name-based discovery. So there is a DNS associated with it. And this is the role of the DNS server within the cluster. So Kubernetes has many such interesting features. Uh, this is just scratching the surface of Kubernetes really, right? That's what it is. So this is how Kubernetes works. I've shown you the, some of the key features, like how to set up a Kubernetes environment, how to deploy the microservices applications by launching two services, vote and uh, result here, these two, vote and Redis, right? And I showed you how to create a cluster with the utility called as kind, which is a very, very interesting tool as well. Let's you run a complete environment out of your nodes and then it is easy to delete those as well. I've shown you that as well, but uh, let's say kind delete cluster. That's all I, it takes for me to clean up this environment. And I'm back to my setup with Docker server. And I'm done with the Kubernetes environment completely. It's wiped clean, right? It's wiped clean. I don't have a trace of that Kubernetes environment anymore. It is as easy as that. So if you have a Docker environment, it is easy to create a Kubernetes setup with kind, uh, equally easy to clean it up as well. And in the meanwhile, you can try out these labs and there are a bunch of those labs. These are all available for free. Uh, this is like multiple projects built into it actually. So you can try this out as well. And when you're ready, uh, if you are not a member, you can consider uh, you know, enrolling into our School of DevOps programs as well. Right, so any final questions uh, that you have for me? If not, uh, we're done for the today's session and next week we'll come and talk about Argo CD. And then finally, talk about how do we set up monitoring that is with uh, Prometheus and uh, Grafana on top of Kubernetes already. Argo CD is just going to take this role deployment uh, to the next level and we can do more advanced rollouts and set up automated continuous delivery to different environments. That is what Argo CD is all about. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next week. Right, but that's all for today, folks. So thank you very much for attending today's live session and I'll see you uh, next week. This recording will shortly be published on our YouTube channel as well. So if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, uh, let me share that link with you. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and uh, also have everyone else that you know uh, who you would find this useful uh, can subscribe as well. There are a lot of free resources and a lot of training programs, live sessions already available on our channel. And I'm started uploading the shorts with uh, some useful nuggets as well. With that, thank you. And uh, I will see you next week. Bye-bye.